Hello and welcome back to the Digital Health and Wearables series. Today I have another magnificent episode for you, but before I go ahead, make sure you subscribe to the channel and check all the amazing previous content. And also let me acknowledge our digital health platform, Clinitouch V, and our series partner, Fujifilm Healthcare. But it gives me great pleasure to introduce you today to Charles Michael Gibson is the CEO of the BAEM Institute for Clinical Research, formerly known as the Harvard Clinical Research Institute and Perfuse, and is also a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the founder and editor-in-chief of wiki.org. Mike, how are you? Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for being in here and accepting the invite. I know you're very busy with lots of different things. A pleasure to be here. So today we are talking about virtual clinical trials. And the first question that I have for you is, what are the forces driving the adaptation of virtual, virtual trials? Well, there are several forces. I think the biggest force is the fact that spending a billion dollars every time you want to study a new cardiovascular drug is not sustainable. Uh, you know, it costs somewhere between at the very, very low end, maybe $12,000, usually close to $30,000 per patient, upwards to one hundred fifty dollars to $200,000 per patient in oncology trials. That just is not sustainable. So we've moved more and more to virtual trials which will cost about 1%, 1% of that. So if we could dramatically reduce the cost of executing these trials with no trade-off in quality, uh, that would allow us to speed development by having a lot more shots on goal. So much of the cost is related to the bricks and mortar uh, that surround a trial. So we've moved increasingly to more of a virtual uh, conduct of these large international studies. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much for that amazing insight. I knew it was a very expensive and non-sustainable process, but I wasn't aware that the cost was so great. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. The second question that I have for you, which follow up really nicely is, how does a virtual uh, trial differ from a traditional bricks and mortar uh, trial? Wow, there are so many ways. I mean, first of all, you're getting rid of the bricks and mortar. And it won't be hospital-based. It will be virtual. So you can sign up for these trials anywhere, uh, you know, from the comfort of your home, home, for instance. As an example, we're doing a trial called the Heartline Study of the uh, Apple Watch versus placebo to see if you can detect silent or asymptomatic atrial fibrillation earlier. We're hoping to enroll tens of thousands of patients around the US. Now, you don't have to go see your doctor to enroll. You don't need to see a nurse to enroll. You can enroll from anywhere. And in some ways, this levels the playing field. You don't have to be in the big city near a major academic center to participate. Uh, you can participate from anywhere in the country. So cutting back on some of the human resources uh, will improve things. Many of our trials in the past were bricks and mortar and paper. Uh, these trials are being done obviously electronically and rather than ticking off boxes on a piece of paper, uh, people will be ticking boxes off on, a, um, on an electronic case uh, report form. So we're moving from a paper-based world to an electronic world in the past, patients signed a piece of paper consenting for the study, but in the new virtual world, you're consented over an app. In some ways, this gives you better consistency in the consent process. Uh, people watch videos, they get the same educational content, they hear from expert communicators. So everyone has access to the best kinds of uh, information. 
And again, rather than using a local IRB, a central IRB, one IRB will be used, which will again cut down on manpower and resources. This is okay because it's not a hospital-based trial, but a centrally done trial. In terms of who's being enrolled, in the past we had a lot of very specific inclusion criteria. That gave you a fairly narrow population. In the new trials, they're much more generalizable. We're hoping to study much bigger and broader populations uh, to make sure the results are generalizable. Because we can up the sample size, we can include some people that may be at a lower risk uh, for uh, adverse uh, outcomes. One of the things we always worry about in a study is, are we going to have enough patients? Are we going to have enough statistical power to answer the primary question, the primary endpoint? Well, in a virtual trial where you have tens of thousands of patients, we should have plenty of statistical power to answer definitively the primary endpoint. We may even have enough patients to ask and answer many important secondary endpoints. What's interesting is we have to be careful. You know, we could identify small differences in these virtual trials that are statistically significant, but we have to make sure that they're also clinically significant. Uh, so, you know, that's going to be an important part of how we interpret uh, these trials in the future. We struggle month to month, week to week in looking at metrics of enrollment. We hope to enroll a thousand patients, for instance, a month. But as we saw with one of the previous Apple HeartWatch trials, you can enroll, say, 50,000 patients a month. It's a whole different process and a whole different scale of uh, enrollment. Where are these people coming from? They're not coming from the doctor's office or the hospital. They're getting engaged through social media, things like Facebook, um, AARP. You know, we're trying to find older people for some of our studies. Uh, a lot of TV outlets run, you know, segments that I talk about the study. So maybe in 50 different local TV stations, I'll talk about it in a national TV. Uh, you know, insurance companies are getting engaged because sometimes the technology will reduce the cost of care to patients. So you've seen a lot of direct to consumer advertising. You're now going to see a lot of direct to consumer approaches to getting them engaged uh, in trials as well. Uh, you know, I think the other big issue is who has access to the data. Traditionally, the patient didn't have access to their data, but in an electronic world, with all the data being on their app, they can access their data. They can look at their EKG. They can show it to their doctor or their family member. You can even set up alarms so that the family members are notified if there's an event. So there's a broader engagement on the part of the family and the patient also has access to their information. Another big issue is who's getting paid to do the work? In the past, nurses and doctors were reimbursed for all the paperwork and everything. But here, we will be paying the patients uh, a fair market value for the time that they are using to fill out all the paperwork um, on the app. Another thing we always did in trials is we would have a group of physicians look to see if someone really had an event. That's called independent uh, clinical event committee adjudication. Here, instead of doing that, we're going to the insurance companies and saying, you know, did Mr. Jones get admitted? Did he get admitted with a heart attack? Did he get admitted with a stroke or bleeding? So we're using the ICD-10 codes uh, of the insurance agencies to see if people had events. And we've published recent literature showing that using those insurance codes matches up very well to if you had a doctor sit there and go through the chart and see if the uh, patient uh, had an event. Patients in trials get great care. They have a nurse phoning them. Did you take your pills? Let me count your pills. But this approach will be much more of a real world look at how people do uh, without all that pestering from a lot of the uh, medical staff. 
I, you know, I think the uh, other big issue is safety and looking over the safety of a trial. It took a while to get all those events, you know, into the case records and everything so we could look at them. Here, by using the hospitalization records, we get an instant read on whether people have been hospitalized with an event, and that allows us to monitor the safety more closely. Finally, a big thing we always worry about is people who go missing. But when you use the U.S. government's hospital admission system, no one goes missing. So you have a complete ascertainment of uh, all the endpoints um, you know, uh, in the world. So I do think the coupling of these apps with wearables, and those wearables will collect terabytes, terabytes of information about each patient. We'll have a lot of information that we can explore. We can understand the physiology better. We can generate new hypotheses that deserve to be tested. It's just so amazing to think years ago when we started, when in the 80s, when I was starting off, you know, we had a computer that had a 20 megabyte hard drive. And now, you know, each patient will have terabytes of information. You know, it's clearly the world of big data. I hope we get big insights at a fraction, at a small fraction of the cost of where we used to be. So I think it's a, it's a fascinating time where wearables along with all these apps are really gonna hopefully improve the way we do clinical, clinical research. Brilliant. Thank, thank you so much for that magnificent piece. I mean, explanation, very educational. You mentioned wearables in the end. At the beginning, too, you know, I'm very passionate about wearables. Also, my, my vision is that the wearables can change the world, but the, the wearables are an excellent vehicle in clinical trials in the management of chronic uh, diseases and so many other health-related uh, um, uh, benefits. But you mentioned also... Uh, Mike, the remote monitoring, in other words, the virtual, we we now seeing that the remote monitoring is here to stay, the virtual clinical trials, people are coming out of the four walls of the hospital to be treated at home, to be monitored at home through wearables, through devices, through technology, so many things to consider. We could rule out this question and, and run with it and create another episode on his, in his own right. I really, uh, I really like that amazing comprehensive description it was educational but also it touched on so many important points the the patient data the the issues around security safety but also you mentioned the digitization things are changing and the combination of the digital technology the apps and engaging people and the patients in this case in a, in a, in a different way in a more effective manner also puts the control in their hands thank, thank you so much for that the final question that I have for you is, what do you see in the future? That our hospitals can easily get overrun with patients. We're going to have to look for ways to try and keep people who don't need to be in the hospital out of the hospital. We're losing healthcare provi professionals in our country. I know you are also in the UK. 20 to 25 percent of healthcare professionals are leaving the profession. Uh, we're going to come up short. So we need technologies, monitoring, wearables virtual appliances uh, to help extend healthcare uh, so that we can take care of all those uh, people in the future. We may not get there in a single leap. I think you'll see a lot of hybrid models in the clinical trial space that integrate some of this. The approach I told you about is a fully virtual approach, but I think uh, we'll end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, but like you, I think wearables are gonna play a central role in that transition. Brilliant. Mike, fantastic episode. Let me thank you so much again for being in here, but also congratulate you on your amazing work throughout the years. I've been following you and also you broadcast this message on the media and everything. Appreciate you here. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Love talking I, to you. I, I don't know if you watch the episodes, but I finish all my episodes in a peculiar way. It's not really a question as such. It's called One Minute of Fame. You can mention anything, Mike, your work, shout out to anybody, personal, family, anything whatsoever. Before I round up, one minute of fame, over to you. Well, so many people are hurting out there. And um, 
you know, we've been through a lot, all of us as, as uh, the world for the past two years. I think we have to get beyond the name calling, the fights uh, between the vaxxers and unvaccinated. We need to put this behind us. We need to come together. We need to care for each other, care about mm -hmm. each other. Uh, we got to get back to treating each other uh, with respect uh, and caring and love. I also think we have to do a deep dive on what constitutes fact. You know, everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but we aren't entitled to our own facts. Science has taken a big hit during the past two years, and we've got to resuscitate science, and we've got to rebuild people's trust in science. People have to understand that science changes as the evidence changes. Uh, they have to get comfortable with uncertainty and the uncertainty that comes with science. We have a lot of work to do to rebuild our trust in science, rebuild our trust in people who conduct that science, because I really do believe at the end of the day, that's probably our best path forward in terms of managing crises like this. We have to do better. Mike, what a way to finish. Thank you so much for that powerful message for all of us to come together and push in the same, in the same direction. Thank I you agree. so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. I'm going to round up now. Um, thank you so much for our viewers and listeners. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Let me acknowledge again our digital health platform, Touch V, and our series partner, Fujifilm Healthcare. And make sure you follow Mike's work. I'm going to post here his Twitter, his LinkedIn, a true expert. Follow his work, connect with him, ask him questions, and I'll see you all next week.